the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We pray together our prayer of the day. Let us pray. The love of God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to you know those things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do that. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Scripture reading this morning from the Old Testament, from Isaiah, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 7. In this chapter, Isaiah is speaking about God and his relationship with Israel and how he planted Israel and what has happened. Verse 1 Let me sing to my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the middle of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, it yielded wild grapes. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. I shall be I shall not be it shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overrun with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no more on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are its pleasant planting. I expected justice, but saw bloodshed. I looked for righteousness, but heard a cry of distress. The psalmody is Psalm 80, verse 7 through 15. We'll read responsibly. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought out of Egypt. You cast out the nations and You cleared the ground for it. It took root and filled the land. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea, its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall, so that all who pass by can pluck out its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold, behold this tender vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. Here ends the psalmody. Thanks be to God. The second reading is Philippians 3, 4b through 14. Paul reviews some of his supposed credentials, which no longer have any bearing in comparison to the right relationship he has been given through the death of Christ. The power of Christ's resurrection motivates him to press on toward the ultimate goal eternal life with Christ. Paul writes, If anyone has a reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the tribe of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gain I had, these I come to regard as trash because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. 
for this sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, that righteousness from God blessed on faith or based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in death. If someone I know or if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have oh, not yeah, pardon me. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead, I press on to the goal of prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the second lesson. Thanks be to God. As you're able, you may rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day is Children of the Heavenly Father.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I'm a big fan of architecture of all kinds. And of course, Frank Lloyd Wright ranks up there with the best architects of all time. And I remember reading a story about a grand hotel that he built, designed and had built in Tokyo. And this grand hotel withstood the 1923 earthquake in Japan, which was one of the biggest earthquakes they ever experienced. And there was some 140,000 people who died from that, that big earthquake. But this hotel was designed in such a way to withstand, to almost ride on top of the waves of the earthquake. And that's because Frank Lloyd Wright had decided to build it, as he says, like a series of boats connected to one another so that when the waves or liquefaction of the earth happened during an earthquake, that hotel would move along with the movement of the earth. And so what he did was, which was pretty ingenious, he sunk these pilings, they're called, or giant posts, way down deep into the ground because that ground, he said, after about eight feet, was about 60 feet of gelatinous mud. So he sunk, he sunk these pilings down into the ground and then he poured the foundation onto those pilings, not deep into the ground, but just onto the top of those pilings so that they were resting, the foundation was resting on the earth. And he did not pour one grand foundation, he poured it in segments. So it was really a bunch of foundations separated by some space connected to these pilings so that when the earthquake happened, they would move separately. Then he made all the different rooms to be linked together in a hinge uh, sort of way, so not firmly fastened to one another. So all the rooms of this hotel were actually hinged together so that when the earthquake came, it moved like a bunch of boats connected to one another with ropes. And actually, interestingly, uh, a lot of the buildings were destroyed in Tokyo, but a lot of the more ancient buildings, they also survived because they also had that understanding of linking things together rather than firmly fastening them together. So in a way, Frank Lloyd Wright was rediscovering something that was very ancient. So, because of this solid design work, this grand plan, according to a master architect, that building survived. And we know that vineyards and orchards and farms also have a kind of architecture. You need to know where to plant your vines, where to channel the water, how to disperse the water. There's a very definite architecture to agriculture as well. According to a grand design, a great plan, a master architecture, that if that architecture is honored and followed, there's great blessing as a result. Well, now we come to Jesus' parable today. In Jesus' parable of the vineyard tenants from Matthew 21, the landlord and master architect of the vineyard made careful preparations, it says, careful preparations for his land and his harvest as he planted the vineyard, built a security fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and erected a watchtower overlooking it. Then, confident of his design, of his architecture, he planned to leave the country. He would not be there to tend his vineyard, and his harvest. So he entered into a covenant contract with tenants to take care of the vineyard in his absence. But when the harvest was beginning to come in, the landlord sent representatives to collect the first fruits of the harvest according to the covenant agreement with the tenants. After all, it was his land, his security fence, his wine press, his watchtower, and his graves that the harvest would be gathered from. But here, brothers and sisters, is the issue. Here, the issue of who is in charge comes into play. Those who had worked in the vineyard felt as if they were in control, as if it was their property, their improvements 
and their crop to be had. So the tenants mistreated, it says, the servants that were called and sent by the landlord to oversee the harvest. And the tenants seized them and beat up on one, killed another, and stoned yet another. So he sent more servants, and they too were mistreated by the tenants. Finally, the landlord sent his own beloved son, thinking surely they would not dare do anything to him. But in fact, they killed even his son. So everything that the tenants did to try to assert their control of the vineyard and the harvest did not change one simple fact. And that simple fact is the landlord was still the owner. He was still the one who actually was in charge. The ownership of the land did not change. And the right of the landlord to the fruit of the vineyard he planned, designed, and built did not change. The only thing that had changed was the relationship between those who were the tenants and their landlord. The covenant relationship between tenants and landlord had been broken. You know, the first part of Jesus' parable today speaks of trust. God, the great landlord and architect of his universal vineyard, so to speak, has entrusted us with and placed us in the position of being tenant stewards of his creation and of his covenant word and ultimately of his harvest, the harvest of souls, according to the grace and truth of the gospel. God is the owner and designer of this beautifully diverse world in which we live. And we are God's tenants charged with the work of maintenance and of harvest. And just as the owner and architect of the vineyard had taken all the steps necessary for a rich harvest, so also God has blessed us with all that is necessary all the spiritual gifts that are necessary to bring in a great harvest of salvation and renewal in Christ Jesus. We may not recognize it, but God has given us all the tools we need. So the question is, what kind of tenant stewards are we being? Are we being dutiful or rebellious? Are we being faithful or possessive? Well, the honest answer is yes, right? Yes to both. We're simultaneously dutiful and rebellious, faithful and possessive. But, you see, a major risk within all the segments of our lives is that we might become more and more possessive. We can sometimes slip into thinking, like the church, for example, is ours. That the church is ours. Our vineyard our possession and we forget to see it as God's possession alone and it's not merely the church that we do this it's not merely with the church that we become possessive we can become possessive in our relationships within our families within our community within our nation and our entire world in all those aspects of life we can slip into becoming possessive so the question is, will we be as foolish as the tenants in Jesus' parable and forget that we are God's children inhabiting God's world and called to do God's work? For he is the supreme landlord and great architect, and he wants us to participate in the grand harvest of his holy kingdom. Thankfully, brothers and sisters, thankfully, very thankfully, God doesn't give up easily, just as the landlord did not give up easily in Jesus' parable. Most of us would agree, after the first brutal action by the tenants against the servants of the landlord, the landlord would have been well within his rights to assert his authority. However, the landlord of this parable of the kingdom of God sent even another group of servants to collect the harvest. When this group met the same resistance, he sent 
his only son. And we know what Jesus is talking about here. But there is also a warning here. There's a warning in this parable of the kingdom. When we misuse the landlord's vineyard, rebel against the landlord's authority, and abuse the landlord's servants sent to us, we will not enjoy the abundant life and the great goal and prize of our heavenly call in Christ Jesus, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 3. You know, as the old saying goes, my life is so much easier on the days I remember I'm not in charge of the world. Right? Our lives are so much easier when we remember we're not in charge. Thanks be to God. Why do we forget that over and over? Jesus' parable of the vineyard, parable of these tenants, these rebellious tenants in Matthew 21, points to the tragic loss of a deep, abiding, confident, and hopeful covenant relationship with God because we have taken to the delusion of thinking we are the owners and we are in charge and we decide what's good or evil and what's right or wrong. However, as tenant stewards of God's creation and of Jesus' saving gospel, when we remember that God is the supreme landlord and master architect of all, that God is the ultimate source and norm for what's right and what's wrong, then when we remember that and act out of that, we can reap an amazing harvest of God's eternal grace and truth we can eventually receive that prize and goal of our heavenly call by God's grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. What do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, in God's grace and mercy. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to labor in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the land. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. Help us to be wise stewards of forests, managing their growth for the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders seek the fruits of your kingdom for the good and well-being of all people. Lord, in your mercy. God of insight, we pray for all our partners in mission. Bailey Human Care Center Food and Clothing Ministry, Door of Hope Ministry for Homeless Families, Fred Jordan Missions for the Homeless, Walter Hoving Home Women's Shelter Ministry, Linda Gawthorn of Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Kogi People, Pastor Jack and the VRIM Korean Presbyterian Church, our Scout Pack 307, Interim Bishop Murray and our Southwest California Synod, and Presiding Bishop Elizabeth and our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. 
We especially pray for those who suffer from COVID-19. We pray for their healing and their well-being. And we also pray for those who have suffered the loss of jobs because of this pandemic. We especially remember all those who were laid off from the Disney parks. We pray for them, and we pray that our economy will soon start to turn around. Relieve the suffering of those who have been impacted by the fires, and keep us and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today, especially the family of Flo Fry, Brandon, Shannon, Frank, Philip, Kim, Elsie, Judy, Marguerite, Eulail, Sigrid, Chad, Kenny, Carl, Carrie, Sandy, Ruth, Luna Joy, Haley, Bonnie, Chuck, Annette, Dee, John, Sam, Donna, Ruth, Jane, Dwayne, Ellen, Lynn, Dave, Margaret, Ben, Tyler, and all of our men and women in military service, law enforcement, veterans, and all of our family members and friends who are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all the business owners and managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you for the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As you're able, you may rise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread of life and drink this cup of salvation, we proclaim the Lord's sacrificial death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food of your and send us forth to set tables in the midst of the suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray daily the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the Please be seated for our sending hymn. <laughs>
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.